the value of rupees in Pakistan has depreciated a lot. That ma that uh, makes one dollar is equal to more than 200 Pakistani rupees. So what is the reason behind that? After that uh, Russian-Ukraine war, I can see that some countries prefer uh, rupees for international transactions. So what benefits? What benefits does it make to our country? Do you think that in the future it will go? The interest rate will go to double digit? Thinking that the China and India are going away from dollar trade. What I heard from you and whatever we have read and all of these theories that we read, they only help us to explain the general symptoms of what is already, what, what is actually happening. But at the root of it, they just seem like it's like people just want more power and money. So what is the role of economics in all of this? Today is an era of AI. How will the AI will have an impact on employment? Do you think in present time it is possible to go back to financial deglobalization? So how can we generate a society which is economically um, op optimistic as well as economically understanding from a very young age? open for questions now we'll have another 15 to 20 minutes for questions we'll take like five to six six questions now good evening ma'am and uh, you are awesome you had given an awesome speech on one of our neighbor sri lanka also yeah. and at the same time our another neighbor pakistan um, there, the value of rupees in Pakistan has depreciated a lot. Mm -hmm. That ma that uh, makes one dollar is equal to yeah. more than two hundred mm -hmm. Pakistani rupees. So, what is the reason behind that, ma'am? Yeah, Pakistan is actually a very interesting and a tragic case. So, in some ways, you can blame internal Pakistan political economy, which has been, you know, very rough and very adverse for the political instability, the elites, and so on. But you know, you can also blame the IMF. Pakistan has been almost continuously under IMF. Yeah, it's always had more or less one way or the other, some IMF program or the other. And each time the IMF tells it to do certain things, it does those things and things get worse for the mm -hmm. economy. So a lot of what the IMF recommends for Pakistan is really not good either for the economy or the people. In the latest round, right now, you know, they are desperate. They have one and a half months of imports worth of foreign reserves left. And they have gone to the IMF saying, okay, whatever it is, we'll accept all your conditions. But you know what they're asking? They're saying, well, look, you give free electricity to the poorest people. You can't give that. You have to make them pay for electricity. These are people who cannot afford food anymore. You're telling them they have to pay for electricity. They said, you brought in a, a, a law to restrict imports of luxury items for the rich. Mm. You can't do that. You have to open up all imports. Really? I mean, yes. So I would say Pakistan has done a lot of domestic mismanagement, mm. but it has been made much worse by the IMF's approach to what okay. should be resolving these problems. Yeah. I expect soon this problem has to be resolved. And yeah. then, an, another question, sir, please. Uh, actually, after that uh, Russian-Ukraine war, I can see that some countries prefer uh, rupees for international transactions. So what benefits, what benefits does it make to our country? You know, this is a very interesting thing that is happening in the world. The fact that there are these trade sanctions that are imposed against Russia, so in some ways, India benefited, or shall I say, one company in India benefited because we were importing the raw oil from Russia and then we were exporting it to Europe. And so countries like Germany actually got around the sanctions that way. They said, we're not importing from Russia, we're only importing from India. The fact is that India was importing from Russia and then processing it and sending it on to Germany. So this is one way of avoiding the sanctions. But there is another thing that has happened because of all of these sanctions and the freezing of assets which is that more and more countries are realizing, listen, you can't be so dependent on the dollar system. You never know when that will just stop, when you won't be allowed to do something. So many more countries are thinking of alternative routes. You know, so India, Russia, it's almost like a barter trade. It's, you know, rubles or rupees. 
India is doing that with a bunch of Middle Eastern countries now. China is doing that with many countries doing renminbi trade. More and more countries are thinking of alternative ways of going around this dollar payment system, simply because you ca if you are very reliant on it, it can stop any time. Yeah. Madam, before this pandemic, yes. uh, the Western world ruled uh, the interest rate in negative. Now it is a um, single digit. Do you think that in the future it will go, the interest rate will go to a double digit? Thinking that the China and India are going away from dollar trade. That's a very interesting question. You know, I don't think it would hit do dollar uh, double digits in the near future, certainly not in the next four or five years. Why? Because that would make a lot of economic activity unsustainable in the US, okay? And already you're, you've noticed, they've said we are bringing it, we are going to increase but at a lower rate. You know, earlier they would increase by 75 basis points. Now they're saying, okay, we'll reduce it by 25 basis points. So they're bringing down the rate of increase. See, zero or one percent is too low, agreed. But I don't think they're going to let it go above six in the near future because a lot of their own industries will collapse. Okay. Yeah? Um, keeping the dollar as the main source, right? Now, they need to do that. But the funny thing is, so there was an economist called Charles Kindleberger. He had this thing that, you know, money is about power. International money is about international power. And so as long as the U.S. remains the most powerful state, then it will, the dollar will continue to command stability. And, you know, let's face it, there's no alternative. Right? The euro is not an alternative, renminbi is not an alternative, so people will continue to hold the dollar. But the more that the U.S. does these other things, like freezing assets, you know, the more people will say, well, maybe we diversify our reserves, we'll hold them in other currencies, we won't, we'll think of other finance routes, we'll think of other ways to trade, because increasingly every central bank governor in the developing world and Every finance minister must be thinking, how much can I rely on the U.S.? So let's just think of alternatives. So going away from dollar as an international transaction currency for India is a good thing. It's not easy. I don't think it can happen just like that. But already you can see that India is going in some of that direction. It's diversifying some of its actions. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, so... Uh I was wondering yeah. to, 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 to what extent are all of these problem causes problems causes of essentially moral failures because all of these all the economic implications they just act like the, what I heard from you and whatever we have read and all of these theories that we read they only help us to explain the general symptoms of what is all what, what is actually happening but at the root of it they just seem like it's like People just want more power and money. So what is the role of economics in all of this? Like, yeah. how, how does one solve all of that? <laughs> there, there are no yeah. provisions in none of the macroeconomic theories that we study which claim that these issues, they don't even come up. They come up as inflation or unemployment and these kind of things. But so. Yeah, that, you know, that's quite a profound point. So morality, let's face it, economics has no morals, right? I mean, it, no, I'm serious. Economics has no morals. And economists also mostly don't have morals. So let's also admit. <laughs> but, uh, but the economic processes that we've seen and we are seeing still, it's not just about morality. It's also about, as you say, power. But it's also about a certain group trying to expand its power. So this very famous financier, George Soros, you would have heard of him, he's a you know, major financial player. He says, it's a class war, and it's my class that's winning. He, he says as much. He says what's going on now is class war. It's the, the rich, large capitalists in finance, in fuel, in pharma, in digital, they are exerting their power, and there's nobody to push back. That's the problem. Right? So it's, if you say, where's the morali morality, we, we don't have the morality because people are not responding to that. It's because we are letting it happen. Yeah? 
we means all of us, really. We are all saying, well, okay, you know, this is the way it's going to play out. There isn't enough of an outcry that, let's say, governments say, we will not allow these companies to make excess profits. It's a simple thing. It's not difficult. You know that they have made three times the profit they've made in the average of the last five years. Tax that. Yeah, it's a very simple thing. It's not such a big deal. Why doesn't that happen? Because not enough noise is made about it. Because the oil companies have a big lobby and they can t impress the Biden government and they're not facing any pushback from people. People are not saying, how dare you not tax those petrol companies, right? In India, similarly, we get a budget that says we are not going to increase any of the things that matter for people. The employment scheme, health, agriculture, education. We're not going to spend any money on that. In fact, we're going to reduce the money on all those things. Where's the outcry? What do you get instead on the front pages of every newspaper? Best budget ever, so wonderful, 11 on 10. You know, so in a sense, it's because we don't push back. We, we shouldn't expect morality from, you know, large capital or people in power. We should expect them to respond to popular pressure. So until we create that popular pressure, they're going to behave the way they do, you know? Yeah, uh, she, I think you want to add to that. Just, yeah. We can't hear you, then. Yeah. So, so the essentially, until and unless the democratic institutions respond, nothing really can be fundamentally done about it. So how gloomy of a future are we looking at from now? Because we're all, a lot of us are like master students from this MSc. And we're doing all of these things and we're concerned about to a certain extent, yes. a few of us. How gloomy is the future? Like just, just right off the bat, are, can these things, I don't think they'll be able to ever resolve, at least in our lifetime, but eventually is there any hope? And what is the role of economics in it? Okay, so big questions there. Is there any hope? Yes, there is hope. Certainly in your lifetime, absolutely, I promise you there is hope. Okay, maybe not in mine because I'm really old. But, but what is the role of economics? So remember, economics is about politics. It's power. Economics is not this neutral, technical thing that has its own laws. There are laws of the economy, but they are shaped by power, by institutions, and by you know what society does. So yes, it is up to us to change these. You're saying until everything happens, but you know things don't happen all at once. It, it isn't one big fell swoop and everything gets changed. These things happen in different ways. And what I have seen in, in my many decades now is that change comes not from the direction that you're looking for it. You know, so we don't always have to think that, okay, we expect change in this way and it's not coming in this way and so it's never going to come. Change happens in all kinds of unexpected ways. The point is to be able to seize those opportunities and demand that governments actually respond to the people. Now, you know, honestly, you guys are here in Tamil that it is, as a state government, it's much more responsive than many other state governments. Not because it wa necessarily that it wants to be, but because the people of Tamil Nadu will not allow it not to be. Yeah? You will demand a public library like this. You will demand 4,500 public libraries across the state. How many other states will citizens say, you've got to give us public libraries? You know, how many other places will you have primary health centers that are functioning all the time with doctors and nurses in them? And it's not, I mean, yes, it's because it's, you know, a government that is, but it's because the people are saying, you have to de de deliver these to us. So a lot depends on how people respond. And it's not inevitable that we're stuck with what we're stuck with. Yeah? Everything can be changed. All of this, everything I've described to you nationally and globally is the product of human beings. So if human beings did it, human beings can undo it. And it will happen, certainly in your lifetime, especially with all of you around to push for it. <laughs> Good evening, ma'am. I'm Abdul Rahman, mm -hmm. UPC aspirant. Uh, I don't have any technical question, but yeah. a very basic question. As we were discussing about the employment, mm -hmm. um, today is an era of AI. How will the AI will have an impact on employment? Especially yeah. after ChatGPT, uh, recent news. 
So, you know, if you leave everything to the markets, that is, you don't do public intervention and so on, then yeah, I think AI will be quite devastating on employment. I mean, you can think of all kinds of things. I, I, I was teaching at a journalism school today, this Asian College of Journalism. I don't know how many of these students will be needed to write articles anymore if chat GPT can write such excellent articles, you know? So yes, there is an impact. But, you know, remember that human history has been full of labor-saving devices. Full. I mean, the whole of human history is a story of more and more labor-saving devices. And yet, there has been employment growth. Why is that? Because there are different things that you can do. Now, it doesn't happen on its own. So what's happening with, let's say, you know, the digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence and all of that, is that it's certain uh, people who control the technology are making massive profits, right? Now, the sensible thing to do would be to tax some of those profits and use that money to invest in things that are employment generating. Which are the things that are employment generating? Care industries. We completely underfund care. Yeah? We ex assume that most care will be done at home, unpaid by women. And when they are paid, then they're not paid properly, pathetic. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't value, we don't uh, give them respect, and we don't give them remuneration. If we actually did that, that's hugely employment generating. Okay? Uh, creative industries. There will never be a world in which human beings don't want new things for entertainment, for pleasure, for creativity. And if you can actually fund some of that, that improves the quality of life, that is also employment generating. And people can use AI to be creative as well, right? So you shouldn't see technology as a threat. It's only a threat because of capitalism. And they want you to see it as a threat because they want to scare the hell out of you so you won't dare ask for your rights, okay? We should see technology as enabling, but technology has to be used and the fruits of technology have to be shared, yeah? Which basically means you have to have public intervention. You can't leave it to just markets and the, the rich people who control big companies to decide. You have to let a responsible and responsive government, so remember both are important. I don't know at the national level whether we have either, but we need a responsible and responsive government to actually make sure that these gains from technology are widely spread. Yeah? So, you know, don't fear it. I mean, I was shown today a wonderful reading room for the children in this library. And apparently there's this sort of virtual reality bit that they go and they have dinosaurs next to them and so on. It's fun. It's, why not? Yeah? This is AI assisting something else. Let's not treat it as something which is inevitably going to come and destroy workers. It's only going to do that if we allow it to, and that really comes back to the whole political power question. It comes back to the question of how we force our governments to, to use what is available in a way that benefits people. Yeah? Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there's a question like, uh, there's two sets of people. First is the people who are power hunger, the people mostly towards politics, and the people who are holding towards the economist side like business entrepreneurs people, they mostly consider the money aspect and the power aspect. And we, we are social beings. And we respect and we are concerned about other people. But those people aren't. And uh, the first question is this, so would this ever change? And the second question is, uh, the, peop uh, the US is the power uh, after this, uh, after uh, all the economy shifted to dollars. Mm. And it's been severe times, and this is a cycle of recession and uh, inflation and recession. This, this happens every time, and there's a cycle of it. So these people who are in power, they'll always, they try to curb the countries which are in the lower, which are in the developing stage. It always happens. Do you think, would it ever change, ever or ever? You know, don't be so depressed. It's not, it, of course these things change. It's never, look, for heaven's sake, India was a colony for 200 years, right? Was it ever and ever? I mean, you're saying, yes, the people in power and globally and internationally, they're doing terrible things. Sure, they did much worse things in the past. I mean, they had slavery, for God's sake. They went and, you know, colonized entire countries and grabbed people and made them slaves. I mean, they did really bad stuff. Did these things change? Yes. 
So, you know, it's, it's not that it's inevitable and it's, it's just going to be horrible the whole way through. Yes, these things change and history actually allows much more scope for progress than, than you can sometimes think. I mean, I agree. Sometimes you look around and you say, oh my God, this world is so terrible and, you know, our, our society has become so terrible. But, okay, apropos this, I had a teacher in Cambridge. Her name was Joan Robinson. She was a very famous economist. And she used to visit India often. And she came back from her, one of her many trips to India and she said, one thing you can say about India. Whatever you can say about India, the opposite is also true. So just remember that. Yes, there are terrible things happening in India, but there are also great things happening. Yeah? And so we, we have to keep hoping that the great things actually can beat the terrible things. And it's happened in the past. It's not that it's never happened. It's happened even in the recent past. Yeah. Okay, there was a young woman. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, you talked about the volatility of the financial market due to the capital outflow especially during the adverse situation like the 2008 financial crisis and uh, recently during the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Do you think in present time it is possible to go back to financial deglobalization? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, I think it's not just possible, I think it's happening and I think we need more of it. Okay? So let's first ask ourselves what was the point of financial globalization? Why would all of us jump in and open our capital accounts and say we we'll let everybody in and out and so on? Because we thought this would give us more capital for investment, right? That was the whole idea, that we need to invest much more and our domestic savings won't be enough, so we need foreign savings and that way we will invest much more. That was the idea. What has actually happened? Our investment rate in India has been falling since 2010, okay? What about all these other countries? All the, most of the other countries that did this financial globalization, that entered the global financial markets, have not increased their investment rates. Most of them, again, big declines. Malaysia, Indonesia, massive declines in investment rates. And we end up paying more in terms of what we lose it's called a seniorage losses. It's very important. Let me explain it. It's, it's actually a very serious point. So, you know, we allow money to come in and we then end up putting money outside, right? The money that comes in charges us a lot of interest because we are such a risky country. We are a poor country and we're risky. So, it, let's say in US you would get an interest rate of 1%, 2%, 3%. In India it would be 8%, 10%, 12%, right? So, they get a lot higher return because of the supposed risk. Meanwhile, we have all this money in foreign exchange reserves or our rich people who put their money abroad, yeah? They get very low returns. Our average return on the assets we send abroad is 2%. So, we're losing money in this process, right? We're getting all this money as inflow and then we're sending out as outflow. And so, there's a difference of 10% to 2%, right? Big gap. That amounts to more than 2% of GDP. Every year we are losing 2% of GDP, okay? Just to put it in perspective, 2% of GDP is double all the health spending of center and states. Total central and state public health spending is 0.9% of GDP. So we are losing in just this capital coming in and out, which we're not using for our investment. We are losing double of what we could have, we could have tripled health spending in India. Think of that. Yeah? And we know we underfund health, right? We know that people don't have access to basic health care. We could have done that. So we haven't gained from financial globalization. The idea that you had to do it, rubbish. Okay? Most economies in the world have lost. Fortunately, we don't have a big debt problem. At the moment, only Mr. Radani does, but India doesn't. Okay? Um, but many countries do, and they're stuck with it. Now, you're really caught. Once you have a big external debt problem, you're really stuck. You know, you have very little that you can do. So what did you gain from that? So definitely, yes, we should do financial de-globalization. Can we do it? Yes, because they're doing it themselves, if you see what I mean. They themselves are saying, well, you know, you put your foreign exchange reserves in my country, but I've decided I don't like you anymore, so I'm just going to freeze your assets. I won't give you access to your own money. 
It's a bit like a sort of global demonetization, you know? Basically saying, you've got your account in my bank, but that's it, it's mine now. That is not a way in which you encourage a lot of countries to actually either rely on the dollar or rely on this global movement of finance. So I think the way in which the, the, the trade war, the trade and technology war with China, similarly, you know, the ways it's going, more and more countries will say, well, let's hedge our bets. Let's not get too involved and integrated with anyone because at any moment something can come up and shift all of that. So I think we will get more financial deglobalization, and I think it's a damn good thing. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for such an insightful and wonderful session. Uh, my question to you is that uh, when you are claiming that uh, the companies in uh, means just to serve their profit motive, they are the reason behind this inflation. Mm -hmm. So, ma'am, I wanted to ask that: uh, is it was it was it that obvious? Because in uh, means uh, if we follow our uh, stock market, we see some kind of optimism running around uh, the retail investors. Uh, means which is uh, controlling uh, means that seventeen thousand means uh, controlling Nifty from falling uh, below seventeen thousand level. So. Uh, I wanted to ask that: What is the reason behind such an optimism to you know buy the dip uh, still going around the economy? Okay, so in fact, you have two questions in one, right? One is about the whole um, profiteering. Was it so obvious? Yeah, it was incredibly obvious. And in fact, even President Biden in the U.S., President Biden actually said so at the beginning of 2022. He said, "Why are you making all these profits from this?" So it was obvious that they were making, but then I won't blame the companies because that's, look, the purpose of a company is to make profit. You know, so you're telling the company to become something else if it doesn't make. What should be happening is that the government should be regulating it, saying, no, you can't do it. You can't raise the price beyond so much, at least for petrol, or if you're going to raise it, then I will tax all of your profit away. And it's easy, the government can do it. So it's very foolish for, the, for President Biden to go and say, oh, it's very bad, you shouldn't do this, when he can stop them doing it, right? So that's the first part. The optimism in the stock market, a lot of it is also self-serving, right? I mean, these are guys who want those stocks to rise. So you have to give good news, you have to, go, you have to present it as much more positive. I mean, I think there's a general acceptance now that the Indian stock market is overvalued. It's not just one company stocks, over, it's way, way beyond, I mean, price equity ratios are way beyond what is justifiable, right? So everybody knows they're overvalued, but the ones who are holding the stocks obviously don't want to say so. Brokers don't want to say so. People who have a vested interest in it, they're not going to say, yes, yes, it's overvalued. They're going to say, no, it's wonderful, and India future, and you know, we're so more dynamic, and we have this young population, and they keep talking it up, yeah? The problem with us is that the media also talks it up. We don't have a very objective media. Yeah? We have a media that falls for it and you know, reads the press handouts and reproduces those and also says the same thing, or basically talks up the government and the stock market. And that's bad for retail investors because then retail investors don't get the right information, if you like. So yeah, that's really what's happening in the stock market today. Good evening, ma'am. Jai Hind. So, actually, I'm very thankful for the session. And also, thank you for brainstorming us with a very unique idea of thinking about the COVID uh, outcome, about the unequal mm -hmm. uh, exploitation or unequal economic happenings in the world. I just want to ask you that, is it necessary to also build an eco economically responsible society in order to tackle all the problems that we are addressing today. Is it that necessary in times of Atmanarbar Bharat? So how can a citizen or a society, starting from a school level or starting from a college level, as we are seeing many skeptical youths in the society of uh, from 20 to 40 in search of employment, speaking behalf of me and all the youth. So how can we generate a society which is economically um, op optimistic as well as economically understanding from a very young age. Wow, 
<laughs> you know, I think all of you are already obviously much more aware and acute than I certainly was when I was young, so that's already good news. But, you know, if I had a dream, I would say that what I would really want for all young people in the country is to be very conscious of their own social, economic and human rights, but also very conscious of the social, economic and human rights of all others in society. I think one of the problems in India is that we are still a very unequal society internally. We are still very class-ridden, very caste-ridden, very gender-driven, uh, very religion-driven. We have too many divisions among ourselves. And especially caste, I would say, is one of those terrible poisons in our society because it has somehow allowed us to treat many people as not the same as us, you know? And I think what I think for India to progress, we have to get rid of that. We have to get rid of the idea that, you know, uh, that people are not all equally deserving of their human rights. And if you do get a society like that, it would automatically generate, I think, the kinds of economic demands that governments would find it hard to do not deliver. You know, the fact that we can spend one of the lowest proportions of income in the world on health. When I tell my colleagues, I'm teaching in the US now, when I tell them that it's 0.3% central government and total 1% uh, is public health, they look at me like I'm crazy. They think I've left out a zero. They say, must be 10%. Nobody can believe it. How do we tolerate that? How do we tolerate education spending of 3% of GDP when countries much poorer than us are spending 5%, 6%? Why do we tolerate it? I think it's really caste. I think the privileged among us really think that the rest of the people are not the same as us. They don't deserve the same rights. Once we recognize that, I think people with voice will make it impossible for governments not to listen. Does reservations uh, have an impact on this? Reservations are, I think, good because they bring voice to people who otherwise don't get the chance for voice. And I'm actually a fa I'm in favor of reservations everywhere, I, and of all categories. I mean, I want more women, for example, in everything. Because, you know, I have been a woman in a f largely male field for a very long time, and I've realized it's not enough to have one woman, two women, three women. You need enough. You know, then you have enough women in a factory, you make sure that there's proper crash facilities. You have enough women in some other place, it changes the name. Similarly, you have enough people from discriminated castes, it changes the tone of the discussion. I have seen this in my own classes in JNU. When we actually implemented OBC reservation, the nature of the class discussion changed. You know, it, you bring different voices, different experiences, different knowledge, and it changes, it enriches everyone. So I am a big fan of reservations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so thank much you. for... Uh, I'm sorry, but we are already running yeah. out of time. Uh, so thank you so much, ma'am. Right, yeah. right now we have a small memento. On behalf of the state and the department, we have a small memento. And I request our director, sir, to come and present it. Well, I want to thank all of you. It is lovely to actually also be able to see you, but to be interacting with so many young people. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Oh, wow. That's lovely. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> I'm going back laden. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.